So, to follow up on our wildly unsuccessful first video on method acting, we thought we would go for a lighter, more Scottish tone with this one, with a hint less Jared Leto, and give some examples of when actors and directors chase authenticity, even if just for a moment, whether by force, trickery, or on rare occasions, with the full consent of all involved. You see, actors are weird. You spend most of your time begging people to allow you to perform your art, being paraded in front of people whose sole job it is to criticise and deem you unfit to share your art that you love with the world. Hair to the suit, do you not have any value or respect for originality? You're a laughing stock. It's cheesy, but don't it's you disgusting. Copy Cleopatra? I personally I personally found it absolutely artistically atrocious. I mean you're like it's like Norman Bates dressing up in his mother's clothing. It's just a little bit creepy, and I feel like you're gonna stitch someone's skin to your face and then kill everybody in the audience. So when those people finally tell you that you are good enough, that you've made it to the big show. Wait a minute! What the hell? Oh my god! You can finally call yourself an actor. There aren't many things that will make you walk away from that opportunity. Quite the opposite, in fact. Most of the time, you're happy to be taken advantage of and lied to for the greater good. The greater good. Moments like the chest waxing scene in The 40-Year-Old Virgin, which was done for real. Now, that's real acid, so I want to see goggles, people! Real acid? with the full consent of all involved. Or the chest buster scene from Alien, which famously none of the other actors, say Busty himself, John Hurt, knew was about to happen. Trickery. You see, once you've acquired a certain level of prestige as an actor, getting paid obscene amounts of money to do what is essentially adult dress up and playtime, all without the soul destroying begging and fighting for your next paycheck, you would think they would at the very least try and take the acting bit seriously. But nope, even then they cut corners so they don't actually have to do the thing they are being paid to do, pretend. The Blair Witch Project tells the age-old tale of a film company exploiting teen death for money. As we are told in the opening blurb that this is real footage of teenage slaughter that we are about to see released for profit to theatres worldwide. Now, with the passage of time, and in part thanks to the Wayans brothers, the film and the concept in general have become a bit of a joke. What is easy to forget, however, is that at the time this marketing gimmick was employed to such a convincing level that many audiences were suckered into truly believing that this mad shite they were witnessing was real. Well, marketing and the fact that the directors did actually throw three teenagers into the woods scared and alone, with no idea what the fuck was going on. They then stoked the flames of this gaslight by messing with them in all manner of hilarious and entertaining ways. Who needs a script when making a movie? What is the point in actors anyway? I mean, it's much easier to just find a few teenagers, give them a camera and then genuinely make them fear for their own and each other's safety. <laughs> Wes Craven was just a, a play pretend pussy. The three young um, <clears throat> actors were given a basic outline of the lore surrounding the Blair Witch, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Here's a camera, there's the woods. Now fuck off! Oh my god, what the fuck is that? What the fuck is that? <laughs> the directors would stalk the cast, and in the middle of the night would leave various props for them to wake up to, as well as creep around their tents moaning, making noises, poking at the tents. All of this equated to a pretty authentic 89 minutes of shit scared, confused kids getting lost in the woods. <laughs> Gene Wilder once played a maniac who lures children to his torture factory to satisfy his own sick 
egotistical fantasies and something about finding an heir or whatever. Once again, the directors of Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory thought that it would make for better reactions from the children and the parents too if they were ignorant to what they were about to witness. Not just for a scene, mind you, but for the duration of the shoot. Obviously, unlike Blair Witch, there was a script in play and everyone was expected to know their lines, their character cues, etc. As for the factory itself, however, none of the kids were privy to any of it. They literally had no idea what any of the sets would look like. Which, to be fair, made for some nice reactions when walking into new areas of the chocolate factory. Famously, the first time we meet Willy Wonka in the film was also the first time that the cast had met him. So they were equally as surprised and delighted to see that he wasn't a useless cripple as we were. Moving on, there's a lovely scene where Willie takes the kids on a magical, relaxing boat ride. Now, the kids knew that they were getting on a boat. A boat that suspiciously had the correct amount of seats, meaning that he was relying on being a child down by then, but I digress. The kids were told that there would be some flashing lights and that Gene was going to do a monologue. And that's it, really. The fact that he was about to go all Colonel Cuts was kept secret, as was the smoke in the projections. Imagine being 11 years old and thinking that your nice new friend Gene's a pretty swell guy, having no idea that you were about to get hit with this. Must be growing for the rowers keep on rowing, and they're certainly not showing any signs that they are slowing. In what might have been one of the most perfect examples of casting in film history, Darren Aronofsky hired Mickey Rourke to play a haggard, washed up entertainer with a jacked face trying desperately to recapture his relevance and former glory in 2008's The Wrestler. This one is more of an art imitating life than actual method acting though. It's not a huge stretch to think that when Randy the Ram says things like, And now, I'm an old, broken down piece of meat, and I'm alone. That what you are actually hearing is an actor talking about his own position within the film industry. As the handsome, charismatic, and critically acclaimed Mickey Rourke left what he deemed to be the sissy acting industry to pursue a professional boxing career, to mixed results to be fair. Of course, this was back before online idiots falling back onto the sport of boxing became standard practice. For the scenes where Randy the Ram participates in a combat zone wrestling style deathmatch, it's not hard to believe that this was all done for real. You see this dude right here, that beautiful bastard is Necro Butcher, a CZW regular and hardcore wrestling legend who has danced with the likes of Samoa Joe, Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins. It, what? Oh, sorry, Seth freaking Rollins. Necro was indeed happy to make this scene as authentic as possible. Rourke also participated in the professional wrestling rite of passage known as blading. The act of slicing your own fucking head open with a concealed razor to give that bloody effect that we all know and love. There is a myth that's been going around for some time now concerning jellyfish stings and the application of urine to said jellyfish sting. Whether or not the writers of 2012's the paperboy were aware of this and simply writing ignorance into their characters is debatable. However, what is not up for debate is the fact that Nicole Kidman pissed on Zac Efron. Like, for real. Yeah, tight that. That's for dirty grandpa, you prick. The Wolf of Wall Street is a batshit crazy film about some batshit crazy people in a batshit crazy point in time. Evidently not batshit crazy enough for Matthew McConaughey though, who at the suggestion of one Leonardo of Caprio injected his own brand of crazy into the famous chest bumping scene. This wasn't in the script. Not at all. Nothing like it. This was just some shit that McConaughey does in his life to get into the zone that Leonardo of Caprio happened to witness. Off camera, nothing a Hollywood writer could fathom a coked up Wall Street serpent doing was as mental or as bizarre as how Matthew McConaughey behaves in his normal day to day. Now for some actors being punched in the face for real, because 
why not? Quentin Tarantino has made a pretty good career for himself recycling his old teenage masturbation material into original and unique motion pictures that are shot and play out in exactly the same way as the films that he has taken his inspiration from. One of the moments that is truly all of his own, however, is the time that he strangled an actress to the point of her passing out. Because you see, Quentin thought that simply acting like you were being strangled was corny and quite obviously fake, and God forbid bid that we step outside the realm of realism in a Quentin Tarantino film. His solution was, you guessed it, real strangulation. He graciously offered to put his own hands round Diane Kruger's neck and, yeah, he cut off her air supply. He did all of this in an SS uniform, mind you. So it's nice to know that despite emptying his teenage wank bank into his filmography, that he is at least still making deposits for his future self.